Well, good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for 2018. Uh, remind, I would remind everyone present to turn off electrical devices so as not to interfere with the work of the committee. Item one is a decision by the committee to take items four and five in private. Are we agreed on that? Three, four, five. Sorry, three, four, uh, I think it's actually yeah. items three, four, and five. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Thank you. Now, today we continue our uh, inquiry into European structural and investment funds, and we have witnesses today with us whom I'd like to welcome at this point. Um, I should say to you that the microphones will be operated by the sound desk. No need to press any buttons. Um, if you want to come in at any point, please just raise your hand or indicate to me that uh, you would like to do so and don't feel you need to answer every question. And also, if you want to put in further evidence in writing after today's session, uh, please also do that if you feel you haven't been able to cover a particular point. So today our witnesses are, um, starting from my right, uh, moving across the panel, Professor John Bachler, Head of European Policies Research Centre at the University of Strathclyde, so welcome to you. Uh, then Linda Stewart, Director of European and International Development at the University of Highlands and Islands, welcome to you as well. Robin Smale, EIPA Visiting Expert Consultant on Regional Economic Development EU Structural Funds. And uh, last but not least, Professor Steve Fothergill of Sheffield Hallam University. So welcome to all four of you this morning. And if I might begin just by asking a question about uh, an aspect I think touched on in the submission by the University of Highlands and Islands. Um, it's uh, indicated that what is said, the principles and aspirations behind planning for current allocations of ESIF funds were well intentioned, but then you, in that paper, it goes on to say, unfortunately, in practice, many of the original aspirations have not been realized. A uh, small number of SIs gradually expanded into a much larger number, putting a strain on delivery mechanisms. So um, coming in, perhaps, and putting a question to Linda Stewart, first of all, uh, from that, uh, those comments, just how have other EU countries and regions allocated, managed, spent and uh, reconsidered their own funding arrangements and how can we learn from that perhaps? Especially we've seen that the EU itself, the, the funds have become more perhaps bureaucratic or restrictive since roughly 2000 and we've heard that from others. Um, would you like to perhaps first of all come and comment on that? Thank you, convener, and thanks very much for the invitation to come and speak about this, this area, which is obviously crucially important, um, I think, to all of, all of the, the key organisations across Scotland looking forward. Um, this area is a huge, huge challenge, um, and I think listening to the evidence that was given last week, um, members will be fully aware of some of the very difficult practical problems that are around in delivery of structural funds. Looking back to the, the development of the current programme, um, I was involved in that, as indeed I was involved in the previous three programmes. Um, and we were very much aware at the time, about 2012, 2013, looking to put the, the new programmes together, that there had been very serious issues, um, a number of mistakes, interruptions, su suspensions of the, the programmes. There wasn't always a very good alignment between um, national and EU policy, which led to problems with, with match funding. So we did actually collectively, there, there, was, there was quite a good process at that time involving key stakeholders across Scotland um, and looking at the new, new plans. Um, we look very, very carefully at, well, what are the options? How, how do we maintain some of the good aspects that had been developed in the 2007 to 13 programmes? For example, the, the, the concept of the strategic delivery bodies, which did um, deliver ve very well to a certain extent. Um, looking very carefully at what was happening elsewhere as, as well, um, at that time in the University of the Highlands and Islands, we'd done quite a lot of work with, um, for example, University of Corsica on their ESF um, programme and how, how they used it. And there were some interesting transnational aspects of ESF use that, that uh, we looked at carefully. Um, we also did quite a lot of work with some of our partners in the, the northern Scandinavian regions, uh, for example, Academy Nor in the north of Sweden, and looked at how they could as a starting point, say, what are the big ticket issues we really need to address 
and then look at how, how do we actually do that. We also looked very carefully at what was happening um, south of the border. Um, we were involved with Yorkshire universities um, in, in a study that was done at the closure of the 2007 to 13 programmes, um, do, doing precisely that. Um, what has worked well, what, what hasn't. Now, there were a number of issues that came up through that. We'd also done very careful analysis at Highlands and Islands level, working on a partnership basis um, and um, carried out quite, quite a comprehensive lessons learned um, analysis of, of what had worked well and what we should be maintaining. So I think putting all of that together, there was a very, very good understanding at the very start of the 2014 to 20 programmes, the current programmes, on the need to be more strategic, the need to be much more aligned, the need to look at some of the implications for match funding if we don't get that relationship working properly, and the, the need to say, well, wait a minute, um, the, the money that comes to Scotland through the four um, ESIF funds is, is significant in itself and for the work that it does, but it's only a relatively small part of, of what's happening elsewhere with other policy initiatives. So looking carefully at what we needed to do. I do believe, even now, that the concept at the very start of the current programmes was correct. Looking at a small number of uh, very targeted strategic interventions and looking at the role of the national organisations. Um, in, in our case, it was the, the Scottish Funding Council who have overall responsibility further higher education and research, and their role in administer, administering a, a part of that, that programme for the, these purposes. I think um, thereafter is, is when some, some of the problems began to arise. I can speak about these just now, or I don't know if that will come up in some of our later discussions. But the starting point was sound, and it was informed by what was happening elsewhere. Well, I was just uh, wondering, were there specific points that you could summarise that you um, took from studies in Sweden and so forth as to how things are dealt with differently in other European countries that we could learn from or apply? So perhaps very briefly before I come on to Professor Bachler. Mm -hmm. Briefly, I would say the number one priority was getting the partnership right, getting the right mix of partners who are literally stakeholders who have a stake in making it work, who have a shared understanding of what the objectives are and are prepared to work together to make that actually happen. And if there are problems in, in process or systems, whatever, being able to get together and collectively address them. So I would say partnership was the key lesson from what was happening elsewhere. And we don't do that in Scotland or haven't been doing that? or I think we set out with the intention of doing that. I think the system has become overly bureaucratic and it perhaps doesn't allow that. It's taken the focus away from what are we trying to achieve with what do we need to do to, to satisfy the requirements of the, the, the process to too great an extent. And Professor Bachler. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, if we look at why we have the structure or the approach that we have at the moment, um, it's driven by a number of factors. Firstly, there's been a steady reduction in the amount of funding coming in. Um, secondly, there's been an increasing administrative complexity in the management of the funds. Thirdly, there's been a pressure on um, reducing um, the errors or the, um, the, the, the problems with the management of the funds. Um, and there's been an, a greater pressure um, to improve performance. And, and these have driven um, partly by the regulatory framework and partly by um, our, our own experience. And essentially, we have progressively centralised the management of the funds and rationalised um, the, uh, the architecture, uh, if you like, for, uh, for, for implementing them. Um, now, there's a logic to that, and we're not alone. Um, we can see a similar process in Sweden and Finland, for example, um, where, again, um, in the current period, there has been a rationalisation of the administrative structures um, and the number uh, and the number of programmes. Um, that's not the case everywhere. Um, in some other countries, like France, there's been a trend towards greater devolution, decentralisation um, within uh, w w within the country. Um, as as Linda said, I think the uh, the changes that have been made have been well intentioned, but I think looking in an historical and a comparative context, I think we have lost um, 
a valued as element of partnership working um, in the in the arrangements. I think the I think we've lost a degree of challenge um, that was. Uh, that, that was, if you like, built into the system because of the, the range of partners that were involved um, in, in implementation. And again, looking over the longer term, I think we've lost a degree of, um, of kind of innovation and experimentation uh, in, in, our, in our approach. And if we look back to the 1990s, early 2000s, a very, very different context in terms of funding. Um, I think Scotland had a reputation for, if you like, pioneering um, the use of structural funds, um, particularly in areas like community development, um, in terms of um, evaluation, um, in terms of equal opportunities, and, and a number of other a, a number of other other, other areas. Um, and I think, if you like, uh, the pressures of of a, of the complexity of administration in its broadest sense um, have perhaps unavoidably. Um, pushed us towards the, uh, to, towards the current model. And I think that, um, you know, whether Brexit had, uh, had, had come along or not, um, I think, you know, there would be an opportunity now to rethink where do we go from here. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll move on to questions from Andy Whiteman and the other members of the panel will no doubt uh, come in and follow up with some of these things as we progress. Uh, thanks, Convener. <clears throat> yes, I'm interested in the... the um, the fact that in, in England uh, there are 39 sub-regions, um, are, are each of those a managing authority or is there, just for clarity, anyone? I think wanted to come in. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure on the exact terminology, but you know, de facto the, the LEPs um, <coughs> do take the decisions and oversee um, the funding in each of their areas. And the fact that there are 39 separate local financial allocations in England really distinguishes the English situation from the Scottish situation, where um, you've really effectively just got two allocations, one for the Highlands and Islands and the other one for, uh, for, the, for the rest of Scotland. So within that rest of Scotland, which is a very big and diverse area, you really don't have any you know, specific targeting at the poorest areas um, whereas you do uh, in England, and it really is quite strong targeting, I've got to say, you know, with, with some areas on a per capita basis receiving five or, or ten times as much as, as, the, uh, as the, most pros the most prosperous parts of the country. Why, why is there such a distinction between the way Scotland and England have done it? Um, now, my Scottish colleagues will probably know better on the, on the distinctive Scottish situation, but I think um, outside the Highlands and Islands, all of the Scottish sub-regions fell into the same statistical category for, for European uh, purposes. And therefore, I think the money that the Scottish government received for that area, they, they bundled into one single programme uh, and managed as a single programme. That wasn't an option um, in, in England because of the, the, the sheer diversity um, across, uh, across the country. I think that's correct. Small. Uh, small. Uh, Chair, uh, thank you. Um, of course, in England, during the last administration, the Labour administration, there was regional development agencies, and these were scrapped with the coalition government coming in. And the regional development agencies, if I'm not mistaken, were the principal vehicle for the delivery of structural funds programmes. I'm not sure if they were actually managing authorities but they were working with a regional strategy in most cases. And with the abolition of the English regional development agencies, the local enterprise partnerships came in. I don't think they're the managing authority. I think they would be classified as intermediate bodies who carry out many of the functions of a managing authority. As in most member states, managing authorities are usually a department of state, a ministry but they will frequently use other ministries or agencies or quangos who will act as intermediate bodies on behalf of the managing authority. They, they then hand out the grants, the funding, to the beneficiaries. And the beneficiaries can be a great range of organisations who in turn can hand out the funding to ultimate recipients who might be companies, individuals, organisations. So, so I'm just wondering, looking to the future, um, 
do, um, and we'll come on to discussion about what the future might like, but working on the assumption that the, there continues to be a, a fund broadly of this character, the Shared Prosperity Fund, um, do we need to have more regional targeting in Scotland? I mean, I know in the Highlands and Islands there's frequent criticism levelled at the fact that Inverness gets a lot of money and Inverness doesn't need it, whereas a place like Skye in the Western Isles and parts of Argyll arguably do need regional funding much more. Um, Linda Stewart. Yeah, if I may come, come in there um, to, to address these points. It, it is a notoriously difficult balance to get in all of this. Um, again, going back to the start of the, um, the current programmes, there was some value in having a single pan-Scotland programme for ESF and a single pan-Scotland programme for ERDF. Um, but then you've got to look at how that's administered, look at the governance for that beneath that, that single programme. Um, I think, yes, there were some advantages um, in our ability in the Highlands and Islands as a transition region, knowing that there was ring fence budgets to be able to look at funding allocations, but there wasn't sufficient um, control over how we would prioritise, how we would actually deliver. And I think looking forward, and again, we'll come on to this in more detail later on, um, I think it's, it's doing a bit more work on getting that balance right between having shared national strategies that we're working towards, but the ability at, and yes, I would agree, perhaps a more granular level across Scotland, Highlands and Islands, as far as, as it goes, the, 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 the uh, strategy was, was good, because you're, you're absolutely right, there's a continuing tension about a lot of the funding coming to Inverness. The partners are very much aware of that across the Highlands and Islands and do have very, very uh, robust discussions about that. But also looking at, if I take just one very, very quick example, back to the objective one days, so much money was invested, um, ERDF money invested in Inverness Airport. But thereafter, there was the ability, because you, you were bringing business, you were bringing tourists and, and a lot of um, in investment up to, to Inverness, you were thereafter able to develop the regional airports and spread that benefit right across. So I think it's, it's developing that kind of approach that we need to be looking at going forward. Uh, Professor Bachler. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think one important factor we have to uh, take into account is the extra conditions that have applied to the use of funding, uh, EU funding in this period. Um, firstly, there's been the principle of thematic concentration, where um, in the Highlands and Islands, at least 60% of funding had to be spent on, under, well, under ERDF, has to be spent on innovation, information communication technology, SME competitiveness and low carbon, and at least 80% in the, in the uh, lowland and uplands area. Secondly, um, there's pressure to spend um, through the um, uh, what's called a decommitment um, rate. If you um, commit funding but don't pay it out, you lose it. And thirdly, uh, what's called the results orientation, the pressure on performance, um, that uh, you sign up to certain outputs at the start of the program uh, and, and will be held to account um, for, for delivering those. If we add to that the sort of bruising effect of the experience in the last period with suspensions and so on, um, I, I think you know, at least one strand of thinking within Scottish government was, you know, let's show we can deliver the programme well, that we can spend the money, um, that we can do it in line with targets, uh, and that we meet the principles of thematic um, th 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 thematic concentration. Um, and so it's a question, you know, where are the projects coming from um, under, you know, in, a, in, in terms of innovation, for instance. Um, now, there's also thematic targeting with respect to education, skills, poverty and inclusion, and particularly as far as the European Social Fund is concerned. But I think you know, the, 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 the context for this period has been much tighter constraints um, on, um, on those responsible for, for managing and delivering the funds. So you're really arguing there, or suggesting the reasons why there's been very limited scope to have a better regional approach within Scotland? Well, there are, num there are a number of factors, um, domestic as, uh, in, in terms of the architecture that we, that we have in terms of economic development, the domestic architecture. Um, uh, but I think these factors coming from the external environment, from the regulatory framework and, 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 and experience, I think were, were, were significant. And the four, the four um, reasons you outlined there, are they, are they important factors to take into account in the design of any 
new scheme? Um, yes, I, I, I think there are. I mean, there are um, there are opportunities to uh, to rethink some aspects of the constraints which are uh, uh, potentially less relevant, like the, the decommitment rule that is, was particularly designed to deal with problems in countries like Italy and, and maybe Central Eastern Europe. Um, there's the question about whether we want the same degree of thematic prescription um, that we've had on, a, on an EU-wide basis. Um, there are questions about how we, how we manage performance. I mean, I think all of these are, are I'm not saying we want to scrap all of these, but there's an opportunity to think, well, you know, what, what are our domestic priorities? Um, what has been the experience with administration um, of structural funds? And there are a number of important principles that we can perhaps come on to that I think we would certainly want to retain. And a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, uh, the position papers that organisations in Scotland and elsewhere in the UK have put forward um, have advocated retaining certain principles. But... Uh, I think we have an opportunity to rethink some of these principles that I was talking about in terms of thematic concentration, performance management, um, decommitment. I think Professor Fothergill and Robin Smale wanted to come in, so perhaps, first of all, Professor Fothergill. Yeah, if, if you see the role of the European funds, or indeed the successor to the, to the European funds, has been uh, about improving the performance and the economic well-being of the less prosperous uh, parts of uh, not just Scotland but Britain as a whole, then you'd expect some geographical targeting. And uh, within that area, that part of Scotland that isn't the Highlands and Islands, there's a, there's a huge diversity. I mean, I believe the GVA, the output per head in the Aberdeen uh, city region, is around about 135% of, uh, of the UK average, whereas... You know, in the Glasgow city region, it's only about 90% of, of the UK average. So if you were using the funds to try to, to bring up Glasgow, um, you would expect some uh, distinct targeting of the funds uh, on the Glasgow city region. But that's not been happening as, as best I can understand here in Scotland. As I said earlier, in England, there is a much, uh, a much greater targeting of, of the funds to less prosperous parts of the country. Thank you. And Robin Smale. Uh, thank you. Convener, you did ask the question about how are other European countries doing it. I mean, I would definitely uh, repeat what Professor Backler, John's observations were about concentration, centralisation has taken place in some of the smaller, better off EU member states. As their level of funding has gone down, there has been a natural progression back to centralisation of programmes. The larger member states, of course, Germany, Italy, France, Spain, Poland, they still have regional programs. So each program has a strategy and an approach to what they're going to do within that region. And the regions vary in size from probably a million, no more, up to 12, 15 million Nord Rhine-Westfalen, 18 million. So there's a, a huge range of sizes of regions that can have a regional program. And you always have to ask yourself, as Professor Fothergill says, well, what level of, uh, of territorial or geographical distribution do you want to have? And personally, my experience tells me that we have a good size program here, which is five million or so, not to say that there shouldn't be sub-regions, but there are studies coming out of the EU and the World Bank recently, which is highlighting the huge regional disparities and sub-regional disparities, and it is a growing problem. They're noting that cities and secondary cities are the powerhouse of most wealth creation um, they're creating 40% more GVA than the, the hinterland areas around it. And you go to some member states and the problems of rural areas are massive, absolutely massive, not least just because of depopulation. And so their recommendation, of course, is to have targeting as appropriate within the regional programme within whichever level of programme you choose. They're recommending things like identifying very clearly as 
clearly what are your strong endogenous assets? What sectors are the sectors you need to develop? How do you introduce new technologies to these sectors? They're recommending the use of smart specialization strategies for sub-regions uh, and finding what is your competitive advantage. But more than anything, they're hi highlighting the growing disparities. Thank you. And I think John Mason wanted to come in with a, a follow-up and before we move on to questions from Jackie Bailey. Thanks, it was the follow-up from Mr Smale. I mean, I'm a wee bit unclear what you're actually saying because on the one hand, five million people, you're saying that's quite a good size, take Scotland as a whole. But on the other hand, you're saying there is disparity and we've got traditional areas like Fife, parts of Ayrshire, Lanarkshire, which clearly are in more need. So are you saying we should target or are you saying we shouldn't target? What, what I'm saying, because uh, I, I don't want to miss the opportunity, I don't know if, convener, you're going to come to this question, but I, I've spent uh, about 25, 30 years looking at different EU programmes and I have to say the Scottish programmes and indeed British programmes generally are exemplary. They are really amongst the best in terms of their strategies, their strategic alignment, their design and structure, their uh, application of the partnership principle, their project selection uh, mechanisms, their delivery mechanisms, their measurement of progress and success, their uh, Evaluation practices, I mean, British programmes, Scottish programmes, frankly, have been the best, amongst the best, in most aspects. What I'm saying is that, in my experience, uh, it is a sensible level to have a regional strategy and a strategic approach at a, a, a geographical area of four to six million. It works well. There's a lot of evidence it works well. Within that, you of course need to identify sub-regions and sub-regional problems, as well as local problems, as well as community problems. And that is what your strategy is for, to, to decide what will your priorities be within that economic region. Right, uh, I'll come to Professor Fothergill and then to Jackie Bailey. I was genuinely surprised at, at you know, what you were saying there. As somebody who maybe 20 years ago um, used to write and manage ESF and ERDF projects, it didn't feel so good um, from where I was sitting. And can I pick um, Linda Stewart's presentation up just a little bit further? Because the criticisms of the operation of ESIF, you know, things like overly bureaucratic, lacking flexibility, changes to eligibility criteria, they were all around when I was writing ESF applications. So I'm interested in the learning journey UHI have been on. You know, you've talked to universities in Corsica in Sweden. Um, was that for the 2007 to 13 program, or was that the 14 to 20 program? Because I'm keen to know how we finally get the practicalities and the nuts and bolts right um, in any future shared prosperity fund. Uh, I would thank the, the member. That's a very, um, a very interesting question there. And, and how do we actually bring things together? Um, <clears throat> certainly the work that, that we did uh, looking at the preparation of the current programmes, we used our UHI experience of working with other partners across Europe, picking up some of the issues that Robin has, has just outlined there, um, but also looking with partners across Scotland. Remember in the early days there was a very, very good consultative approach to developing the, the 2014 to 20 programme. There's a lot of very, very good detailed discussion about how, how we would approach this in the early days. We also looked at some of the options that were coming up from the Commission itself on simplified cost options, how, how you would use unit cost methodologies, um, flat rate costs, other new options that, that were there, and spoke to um, people in, in other member states who had maybe piloted some of these. We'd actually piloted some of these um, during the, the 7 to 13 programmes ourselves in, in UHI. A lot of very, very valuable experience on 
the advantages that some of these new approaches would take, but s some of the pitfalls as well. There's, there's not a magic wand answer to all of this. So um, I think looking at the nuts and bolts side of, of the, the, the administration and management of the programmes, there was a lot of potential there. Um, as, as we've seen, I don't know if we want to go into this in more detail or not, there are current problems over that. But overwhelmingly, I would wish to say these are practical problems that need to be addressed and for which there are solutions. Let's not lose sight of the incredibly good work that ESIF has done across Scotland, particularly in the Highlands and Islands since the 1990s. The, the long-term strategic planning approach and particularly the partnership working has delivered really well for Scotland. Let's fix the, the relatively minor issues um, where, where we can and get something even better next time round, whether we're looking at a you know, a, a shared prosperity fund or whatever other mechanism we're faced with. As John said earlier on, even if it wasn't for Brexit, we are looking at quite a, we would have been looking at a substantial change at the end of the 2020 period anyway, and there would be a need to, to address some of these issues and look at perhaps a substantially different approach in future. Father Gill, you're interested in coming in on one or two points. Yeah, sorry, I, I just wanted to pick up um, on what was said a little bit earlier about the size of the of the units uh, through which you allocate or manage um, uh, European funds. Um, actually, um, in England, a lot of the units are, um, you know, as small as half a million people. Um, I mean, that probably is the size of around about half of the uh, the 39 LEP areas. Um, now to put the Scottish situation into, into context. Um, if you take um, uh, that part of Scotland, which isn't the Highlands and Islands, there's a population there of four and a half million. There is only one programme area in England that um, can exceed that, uh, that population of four and a half million, and that's actually um, London, uh, which for obvious reasons is going to be a, a single programme area itself. But, itself. but every other um, allocation in England is for a smaller geographical area than uh, than in Scotland. Uh, um, certainly, I think Professor Battler wanted to come ah, in on your question, um, and then we'll come back to you, so Thank I, you Bailey. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of points. Um, first, is I I I, I would be um, perhaps less complimentary. Um, than, than Robin Smale about the uh, the experience, the the UK's um, the UK's track record. I think, I mean, if we look at if we look at the the evolution of structural funds in in the UK and in Scotland, um, we've seen more chopping and changing, more institutional change than in any other member state. Yeah. I mean, um, we've lost serious institutional memory, um, and it has been at the expense of. Of, of stability and long term and, 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 and a long term approach. Stability is not always positive, of course, but nevertheless, I, I think I, where, where I would agree, though, is that the administrative capacity below the member state level um, and particularly at sub regional and local level uh, has been excellent. I mean, uh, you know, the uh, it, it has been the, the the partners, if you like, um, that have provided the consistency um, in terms of the administration on. And Mr. Mason's point about the different levels, I, I, I think we're talking about probably about both levels because at national level, um, there are, as the OECD research um, shows about the, 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 the regional challenges, if you like, facing, the, facing Europe, um, there are issues of intensified globalization, of technological change, the impact of AI. Um, these are nationwide issues for us uh, and um, you know, there, 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 there was a rationale for t having a strong strategic approach from the Scottish level. There was also the imp impact of Brexit, which is unknown, but potentially in terms of the, the kind of deal that is reached or not reached, um, the kind of trade arrangements that are that are met, you could have you could see very profound sectoral impacts across Scotland, which will have spatial um, uh, spatial consequences. And I think there there's a need for a strategic role. But I think there is also scope for, to rethinking the sub-regional. Uh, the sub-national approach that, 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 that we take. We have the challenge of ensuring that our cities are drivers of competitiveness, of, of, of Scottish competitiveness. We have the, 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 the challenge that parts, particularly of our cities, have entrenched social inclusion. So we've got very local 
um, entrenched problems of, 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 of underemployment uh, and so on. Um, and we've got problems outside the city hinterlands, outside the city sort of travel to work areas, particularly of small towns and rural areas, um, which have suffered from the loss of, say, major employers, um, where we've got problems of uh, maybe the retail sector collapsing um, because of the withdrawal of banks, closure of post offices, closure of major major stores, and so on. Um, so, you know, I think there 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 are there are sort of multi-level approaches. I think that we need to uh, that, that that we need to be thinking about. Jackie Bailey. Um, can I come back to one key partner, the voluntary sector, who were uh, um, giving evidence to the committee last week and were quite critical of the approach being taken, which doesn't chime with with what you're telling us. Um, I wonder how well you think the voluntary sector engages with managing authorities and whether there's a need for, for change there. Um, but equally, I'm very clear that I think for the 1420 round, um, there's a degree of clawback going on just now, principally amongst the voluntary sector, and it's quite a high percentage compared to previous years. There's also the danger of underspend in the 1420 program. Um, and I just wonder whether you think that is potentially a problem for us as we move across to new arrangements. Who would like to go first? Linda Stewart. I'll start off with a, with a few um, perhaps more, more specific points there. Um, I'm, I'm aware of the problem generally across Scotland and as you would expect more specifically in what's happening in the voluntary sector in the Highlands and Islands. Undoubtedly there are difficulties there. Um, that there, there are a lot of challenges, I think, around the complexities of the bureaucracy just now. And again, I think you went into that in quite a lot of detail last week, so I'm not going to rehearse the same lines again. That has proved difficult for all partners. It's certainly proved difficult, I know, for my own organisation. We run a large um, ESF program on developing Scotland's workforce with the, the, the funding council totalling um, some £30 million over the duration of the, the, the programme. We've had huge problems primarily around just how long the process has taken us to get to the stage which has had a knock-on effect on spend, on hitting targets and on the, the sort of synergies that we had originally anticipated there. So I am aware of the problems. We have been perhaps fortunate in that we've had a good working relationship with the Scottish Funding Council to address these. It's been hugely frustrating, it's taken longer than it should have done, but collectively with them we've been able to work with the managing authority and eventually get to a reasonable um, operational point now for that major programme. Um, if you're a small voluntary sector organisation, however, without um, that, that kind of resource, without necessarily the, the historical knowledge and understanding of how the programmes work, it would be substantially more difficult, I think, to address some of the, these challenges there. And I think that needs to be, be picked up. Um, perhaps on a plus side, if I'm allowed to be positive here, um, I think there has been a lot of very serious talking done over the midterm evaluation of the, the ERDF and ESF programmes. I think the managing authority have recognised to an extent a lot of the, the difficulties. They're putting forward a number of um, solutions that I think will help. Um, including more regular lead partner meetings where they can discuss this kind of operational programme. Because I think one of the, the major drawbacks of the governance in our, our current programmes is that there was very little in between the Joint Programme Monitoring Committee, the very, very high level Scotland-wide strategy discussion and what was happening on the ground with individual organisations. So I think there, there are moves afoot to, um, to improve that. However, I think it is incumbent on beneficiaries, and whether that's the voluntary sector or my own sector or, or whatever, to really grasp that and say, right, okay, guys, we really need to have that detailed discussion and we need to make sure that there are mechanisms to have that kind of bringing issues to the table and working together until we can find the solutions instead of a very protracted system of putting in typically um, email complaints about things. It's put to one person, it's put to another, it's put to another. And by the time you eventually come to some conclusion, even if it is a, 
uh, a positive conclusion, um, then there's other problems that have amassed in the, in the meantime, which has, I think, been one of the, at the heart of some of the problems we've had in this first phase. So let's grab the opportunities that are here in phase two to try and sort things out while we can. We absolutely, just, just to finish, we absolutely need to avoid the level of decommitment that we've had this last year. Um, that, that, that's, that's a given. We need to look very carefully at what the implications for the performance reserve for the programmes at the end. And we need to look very, very carefully at just the missed opportunities that are there if we don't get our act together right now. Thank you. I'm particularly interested in pursuing whether people think we're heading for an underspend and what the implications lie with that for any future funding. Anybody? Bachelor, sorry, Professor Fothergill. Can I, can I just take that one because I've, I've been talking to the civil servants, um, certainly down in London, uh, about this. Um, uh, now, at this stage, um, the... Uh, the financial commitments in this particular spending round are running at roughly the same sort of level that they were in, in, in the last um, spending round. In fact, they're actually slightly ahead, um, I understand. Um, financial commitments is different to actually outturn spending, and outturn spending lags a long, long way behind in the process. So, you know, if you look at the figures for the present spending around 2000. 14 to 20, you know, you will find that only about 10% of the money that's been allocated has so far been spent. But the alarm bells sh shouldn't ring because of that, because in practice, you know, the spending comes through well behind the, the, the commitments. In fact, actually, will well be, um, in terms of getting the money back from Europe, it, it, it comes very uh, last of all in, uh, in, in the process. Um, I wouldn't yet ring the alarm bells. Um, but I think it's something that needs watching, if you know what I mean. Um, briefly, perhaps, uh, Robin Smith. Well, I've got the figures here um, because you can access progress at the member state level yeah. on the open data platform of DG Regio's website. And, and as, as Steve says, the UK, in terms of commitments to approved projects, is the third best performer in the EU right now. So we've earmarked a lot of our spending. We've earmarked nearly 60% of it already, which is good. Um, we are only at the average in terms of actual spending on the ground, that is the beneficiaries using the money on the ground. We're only in the middle of the pack. Um, it doesn't give you, unfortunately, the, the breakdown by program. One has to look at the annual reports for that and so on. And, Right, I'm, I'm conscious um, we're, sorry, yes, well, I'll bring Professor Bachel in. I'm just conscious of time, and there's quite a number of committee members wanting to get in with further questions. So perhaps briefly, Professor Bachler, and then we'll move on to a question from Fulton McGregor. Uh, yeah, I actually yesterday had a look at um, the comparative figures for, uh, for Scotland relative to the UK and the EU. And as, as Robin Smale says, um, Scotland, in terms of it, the commitment to funding, is, is up there um, with the EU average uh, and even ahead in some respects, uh, as is the UK as a whole. But in terms of actual payments, in terms of spending, uh, paying money out, uh, we are at about a third of the EU level. So we, you know, we are, um, and, and half of the UK figure. So I think um, it might not be a case of pressing the panic button, but <laughs> I think there are some issues there. Thank you. Uh, Fulton McGregor. Thanks, convener. Hey, good morning, panel. Um, uh, my question is actually sort of a lot of the issues uh, it's, it's to do with regional uh, variations already been teased out with the, the other speakers, and I think there's been quite a good discussion on it. But perhaps I could bring it together before the convener will move on to another line of question altogether by asking a, a direct question. Uh, if the panel think that the current um, programme works for the regional areas of Scotland, the diverse regional areas of Scotland. Happy for any order. Who would like to come in on that? For the regions, for the local areas. Yes, for the, sorry, so, so the, just the, the various regions of, of Scotland, rather than the two, as already identified. Yeah. 
I think I've so made my views clear already on this. Right. I, I think there is, is a distinct lack of targeting in, uh, within Scotland. Uh, and in that sense, the way that the system is established at present is, is not working as well as it could work. Yeah. C certainly, yeah, yes, I would back that up from a Highlands and Islands point of view. Um, I think a lot, as, as um, we, we touched on earlier on, a, a lot of the, the, the potential is there um, looking at high-level strategic uh, in input uh, on sub-regional level to, to the Highlands and Islands with our allocation of transition region funding and some of the particular aspects of it that John outlined earlier on. Um, one of the problems, I think, is that there isn't this mechanism to say, right, how, how, what flexibility do we have to address specific problems at sub-regional level? Now, I know we've had a fair amount of challenge doing that across the Highlands and Islands, and just very briefly to pick up on the previous point, we do have very strong alarm bells already ringing about current levels of spend. They are troubling in Scotland as a whole, and we can see the evidence of that in the decommitment levels last year, it is even more of an issue in the Highlands and Islands. And unless something is, is done to address this, I think we will be in the same position going forward. So that's why I think there's an urgency in dealing with this. We do need to look very carefully, and this again brings us in, into to your question here. Um, make sure that it's not just the strategy, but the delivery mechanisms beneath that allow for flexibility to spend money on regional priorities in a way that regional partners are able to do so. I know in the Highlands and Islands, it's not that we have a lack of projects. There are issues around match funding, but that often is not the definitive factor. It's that the, the mechanisms don't allow us to bring these projects to the table and deliver on them within the, the, the current structures. Um, now, if that's an issue for us in the Highlands and Islands, I think the point has already been very well made that we need to look at greater granularity within the, the LUPS region and wh what's happening um, across there, because huge diversity across that region as well. That it's difficult to to look at how, how you deliver um, with, with um, an approach that is just pan-Scotland. Thank you. Professor Bartler? Yes, I, um, I mean, we, in terms of uh, uh, assessing or concluding whether it's worked or not, I think we'll have to wait until we can get some sort of serious evaluation, particularly because actually money being paid out is still at a relatively low level, and we're, we're, we're you know, only part way through the period. Um, but um, you know, potentially at, 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 at national level, in terms of kind of the strategic objectives of the programme, um, in terms of improving innovation, ICT, small firm competitiveness, low carbon skills, um, I think although you know, each of those have diff different experiences in terms of take up and, 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 and spend, as you can see from the annual implementation reports. Um, but uh, you know, the likelihood is is that you know, there will be um, significant evidence of effectiveness at national level. The question is whether it is um, effective at sub-national level, particularly at local level, and the degree to which local authorities and other partners are in a more responsive, uh, a more responsive mode. And if we ally that to, or link that to the hollowing out that there has been of local authority capacity. Um, over the last decade um, and the capability for driving strategic change at local level, I, I think there, there probably are, will be some questions about that, um, but we'll have to see the evidence. Right. Um, we'll, sorry, Fulton, did you wish well, to I come back? I just wondered if, uh, if Robin's mail was uh, going to give an opinion on that. Well, you've really made me think. I, I'm not so close to the Scottish situation as I used to be when I was working with Scottish Enterprise um, because I've been in, on the continent for so many years. Our problems would not be alone. Um, I can't answer your question, but I do know that in many other parts of the EU there are problems of engagement of certain sectors for example, if one's talking about the most deprived communities and uh, accessing, helping people with the most serious problems, this is an issue everywhere. And there is a tendency for the programmes to 
uh, recruit, if you like, uh, or um, provide funding to those who are most likely to come forward to participate in courses. It's called creaming. Whereas you take the cream off the milk, you, you basically try and achieve your results in your initiative, and they look quite good because you've really gone for the people who are most likely to come in for help anyway. Going for the hardcore is a challenge I was hearing most recently. Poland, Latvia, Hungary, uh, it's been the same in Belgium, Netherlands. So that, as an example, is a typical challenge right across the EU. Is it because of our approach, our strategic approach, or the administrative structures? I, I am not close enough here to say that. There's other examples like that of perhaps where, right across Europe, as I said earlier, I think actually helping certain communities, certain sub-regions, is a challenge right across the board now. And um, I don't think there's any... There are obviously wonderful cases, case studies, that you can, you can get from other member states. But I, 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 I'm sorry to hear that there have been delivery problems in Scotland, because I stand by what I say, is that in my experience, since being in DG Regio as a national expert in the early 90s through to now is our programmes are relatively good. I have a quick follow-up, uh, convener. Um, I, I think it actually follows up a wee bit from, from that answer there, and I thank all the panel for their responses, but um, it's in relation to targeting, and, and I represent a, a fairly deprived area of the country, uh, an old industrial town, I'm a member of the cross-party group as well, Professor, so I, as you know. Um, but I, I suppose what I'm asking is, you know, if you took Cope Bridge and Christen as an example in my constituency, you would say that that is a deprived area, which it is, and you could target for that specifically. However, within that, you would you do have some quite affluent areas now off Cope Bridge and Christen. And I suppose what I'm, I'm asking is, how do we actually target within even smaller regions again to make sure that, the, the, as you mentioned there, um, certain you know, you're getting the wrong group in the end. So I, I know that might be opening up a full new discussion, and I don't appreciate it, we're quite short on time, so even just one answer or, uh, you know, cheers. Yeah, could I just say uh, that sometimes the, the, the best way to help, you know, a very specific small area such as Cope Bridge is not necessarily to target all your energies on Cope Bridge, because actually regional and local economies tend to function, you know, at a sub-regional scale, actually. So sometimes the best way forward is to, to grow the wider area within which Cope Bridge is, is located. So I'd be thinking of West Central Scotland there. Um, and it's the failure of the European funds at present to specifically target the less prosperous sub-regions in Scotland that to me is, is its great shortcoming. That said, um, when you're looking at, say, training programmes where you do, do target individuals rather than businesses, there, there is clearly perhaps a more uh, compelling case for um, you know, really going in hard in some of the most deprived uh, communities to try and, to get below the cream, as um, as, as Robin has, has, has put it. Uh, Professor Bartley. Yeah, um, I, th I think it's interesting that uh, at the start of the current period, um, the European Commission was particularly concerned about the Cope Bridges and 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 others in a, in a, in a similar situation, and concerned that structural funds was being t was being strategically designed and spent at too high a level. And so it made provision for what it called integrated territorial provisions um, in terms of, in the jargon, integrated territorial investment, community-led local development. Now, the Scottish government decided not to go that route and, and use those because it argued that there were domestic opportunities um, that, 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 that could be used. But if we look back now at the early experience of using these new integrated territorial provisions across Europe, uh, it has really um, revitalised uh, new approaches to sustainable urban development, particularly at the at the level of of towns or neighbourhoods or communities. Um, and there's there's quite a lot of interesting new thinking that's been going on, which I think we can learn from, regardless of uh, of, of Brexit, um, and that are, are potentially particularly relevant um, for for your constituency and others. Right, thank you. I think we'll move on now to Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Um, reference has been made to the Shared Prosperity Fund, 
Ideally, when should that fund be put in place? And in the lead up to it being put in place, what should the process be to establish it? You know, what sort of consultation should take place to determine the fun how it's going to operate? Who would like to start? Well, Professor Fothergill. Let me kick off. I, I think what we need is a fund that is operational from the 1st of January 2021, so that there is no hiatus um, between the ending of the um, existing structural funds, which, you know, even though we're likely to leave the EU, you know, in March next year, our access to the structural funds will trundle on uh, in terms of what, you know, we're making new financial commitments, it will trundle on right until the end of December uh, 2020. Now, we want a seamless uh, uh, transition. So we've got rather longer uh, to, to make that transition than we first thought was going to be the case, because we did think that March 2019 was, was going to be the, uh, uh, the, the cut-off. In terms of the process to, to get there, um, I mean, my understanding is that the Westminster government is going to launch a full-scale consultation exercise. Well, it was a commitment to, to uh, in the Conservative manifesto for the last general election to launch such a consultation. Um, the civil servants' current expectation, last time I spoke to them, was that that consultation exercise would probably be launched in the autumn um, of this year. Um, so we, we have quite a time to begin to develop ideas, to plant ideas, um, even before the consultation exercise starts, because I suspect when that consultation does emerge from... Um, uh, from the Westminster government. It won't be of the form of, well, chaps, we've got an issue, what do you think we shall do? I think they will already be formulating ideas as to you know, what the post-Brexit world might look like, and they'll be tabling suggestions. Um, so they will be halfway there by the time we get to, to autumn. So it's a, the, the, the timing of this, um, this inquiry is, is exceptionally fortunate, actually. If you can say something on these issues, this side of the, uh, of the summer break, I mean, it will help shape, perhaps, what emerges in that consultation exercise from, from the Westminster government. Um, Professor Bachler. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we've got three separate issues about the, the, the future of funding arrangements after, um, after Brexit. The first, one is policy, one is money, and one is institutional arrangements. Um, the, the policy one is fundamental, and we haven't really started to, to consider that. And um, one concern is whether the consultation will be sufficiently sort of policy-led that, that it opens up. Uh, where is it that we want to go, even if there are transitional arrangements in order to get us to somewhere more, which, which involves more fundamental, uh, fundamental reform. Uh, the second question is money, and crucial to that is what kind of indicators uh, are, uh, uh, are used for the allocation of, 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 of funding. Um, Scotland did exceptionally well um, uh, in this period um, with probably about 40% more than it would have got with an application of the EU, for, EU funding formula, as did Wales and Northern Ireland, pretty much at the expense of, of, of England. So there were some important political as well as questions about allocation mechanisms. Um, and the third question are institutional arrangements. Um, it's, the, it's been presented as a UK-wide shared prosperity fund at the, at the, at the moment. Um, and the question is, how will that work in terms of uh, the devolved administrations and, uh, and below that, um, city authorities or city regions, local authorities, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, I think that there is, um, I, you know, I, 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 I suspect that when it comes to the money, uh, what will be critical is to ensure a degree of continuity so that there are no sudden breaks because we know from research that sudden breaks in the allocation of structural funding or in other funding streams can be really damaging to, uh, to, to regions. We've seen that, for example, in South Yorkshire um, with its downgrading of, of EU's funding status. Um, but uh, there are some important principles that we would, I think, should think about building um, the design of a shared prosperity fund around. 
Um, one is, as I said, devolution um, or decentralization. A second is multi-annuality, that there is a predictability. Um, let's not go back to the sort of days of annual budgeting. Um, the third is partnership, um, both national and subnational, but also well, horizontal, and perhaps reinvigorate some of the, and address some of the problems we've been talking about um, today. Integration, in, in other words, um, bringing together different, different funding streams within a, a common framework, um, and accountability um, in terms of uh, in, in terms of the transparency and openness. So. Um, I think you know there are some guiding principles that we could potentially think about. What is it that we would want to keep from the structural funds, uh, the, 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 the structural funds uh, experience? Linda Stewart. Sorry, I think Linda Stewart wanted to come in. Um. Uh, no, just to pick up uh, on a couple of points there, because I, I think that the previous two speakers have really ju just just given us um, the, the key issues that we need to be aware of. Uh, on, on your issue of when we need to, to look at um, putting in place whatever is to replace um, ESIF, whether it's the Shared Prosperity Fund or whatever mechanism it is, there is a real urgency. John mentioned the, the danger of hiatus in, in, in funding. Now, even if we weren't looking at a very, very different situation that's likely post-Brexit, we would be, I think, putting a lot of pressure on now to say, could we start having these conversations about what comes next? There's always a substantial change at the end of one ESIF funding programme to the next likelihood is it's going to be more of a change this time round. It takes time to develop that kind of new approach, particularly when we're looking at substantial changes. We need to look at particularly bringing in more of the partnership approach. Whatever we put together is not going to work unless the people who are going to be involved in delivering it, who are going to be taking responsibility for it, the beneficiaries are fully bought into it and are able to, to deliver. So some really important things there. On the policy issue, j j just quickly, for the Highlands and Islands, the reason we have been able to develop that entire region since the 1990s is a direct result of the EU territorial cohesion policy and the, the recognition of regional disparities within that policy there. Um, without that, um, we're going to have some very, very serious issues, particularly in some of the, the areas and the, the specialised um, aspects we've mentioned before, but I know particularly in the Highlands and Islands, we will still be sparsely populated, we'll still be remote, rural, we'll still have about 94 inhabited islands, there will still be structural issues that are there post-Brexit, no matter what. Um, we will still have opportunities, for example, in marine energy, looking at 10% of Europe's wind energy, up to 25% of the wave potential there. So we're not just saying we're going in with a begging bowl. We're saying with the right kind of help, we can contribute here. And I think we've got to get to, to grips with similar issues right across Scotland when we look at, at what we're planning. That is going to take time. And um, an important point about the, the, the consultation it's now that we need to start addressing some of these issues. I don't want to be in a position where we do get a consultation out and um, it's just, do you agree with this or do you not? We've got to start influencing what's going to come up, the shape and the, the, the direction of travel before it comes to, to, to consultation. So an awful lot of changes, but if we get it right, we should be able to develop something that will maintain the benefits that we've had in Scotland from, from ESIF over many, many years, but maybe address some of the, the, the procedural and system issues that, that we have currently. So, big challenge, but worth going for. Consistently, we've been hearing uh, reference to overly bureaucratic processes, inflexibility. Is there any indications that Westminster has taken that aspect on board and might be prepared to look to addressing it. Well, if you take the Conservative Party manifesto um, at face value, I mean, quite clearly, yes, they're promising a, a new fund uh, that will be less uh, bureaucratic and easier to administer. Um, but there's no detail as to how they're going to do that. But the intention is there, absolutely. But perhaps relying on a political manifesto isn't the best way to go <laughs> But that, that's this. the only government <laughs> statement at this point in time, actually. That, that, that's all we can work from. There's nothing uh, and, else. And, and as best we can tell, um, ministers have not yet progressed their thinking uh, very far, if at all, 
beyond what was in the uh, uh, 2017 manifesto. Isn't that a bit disappointing? Because we're talking about a consultation starting in autumn. Shouldn't they be some way down the line already as to developing their ideas? You, you might have thought so, but on the other hand, given that in December they stitched up the divorce deal, which in a sense postponed uh, D-Day on all of this from March 2019 to December 2020, I think, I think they've uh, taken their foot off the accelerator a little bit on, uh, on this issue. Robin Smell. I don't think we should be <coughs> waiting for these papers. Scotland should be, as Linda says, working with its regular partnership now. The partnership may need to be extended, tweaked, but this is the time to be working up a Scottish economic strategy or a Scottish national development plan or our part of the Shared Prosper Prosperity Fund. This is the time the drafting should be taking, the consultation takes place, the drafting, the ex-ante appraisal, which will take place in the next year or two, and that should be in place, ready at the beginning of 221. I think, obviously, that we have a very different model to that of the English setup. Steve seems to be rather enthusiastic about the local envelopes of money. I think it's absolutely vital that Scotland maintains its strategic uh, approach at that level, where it can also uh, it could devise local envelopes to sub-regions as well. But now is the time. My own calculations suggest that the net contribution that the EU makes to the EU would fully finance the funding uh, for uh, the um, Shared Prosperity Fund, replacing the easy funds. The money is there. Whether the UK Treasury is prepared to, to hand that money over is quite another question. I would think they'll be clawing back a, a substantial proportion. Therefore, you're probably going to be working with a lower level of funding. And if you have a lower level of funding, um, you're then going to have to select what you do more carefully. And so I, I think it's extremely important that the... The, the strategy is well worked out. And working on the continent, as I do uh, mainly, I think the Scots have to think, well, what is it that distinguishes us from other parts of Europe? Uh, where are we seriously lagging behind? Why is our rate of economic growth not as high as it should be? Why are we not dealing with problems of deprivation in the way that we might do? And we really need to get to the nuts and bolts of that. And what strikes me, above all, is the lack of vibrancy of the private sector or the size of the private sector relative to other parts of Europe. So it's about investment. It's about the size of the company base, startups. And perhaps it's about the nature of um, deprivation and uh, mobility. Uh, of people across social classes, do I dare use that phrase. So I think we, we need to choose carefully because when you're, you have a budget pressure, you need to select very carefully what your priorities are. Could, could I just say there that I, I, I think Robin is accepting defeat on the size of the, the fund before we've actually fought the battle. Um, I think what we should be asking for um, is a UK shared prosperity fund that is worth at least as much as the European funds that we receive at present. In practical terms, uh, allowing for uh, the inflation that we've had over the last few years, that means we need to be asking for a, a UK shared prosperity fund of at least 1.5 billion a year. Now, if we don't get that sum, we are facing cuts in, in real terms, and then we all face problems. It's going to be a lot easier for everybody in all parts of Scotland if we can make sure that that overall UK financial envelope um, is of the size that we need. And Robin is absolutely correct in saying that the money is there uh, in the Treasury. This is not money the Chancellor has to find. It's money that he will no longer be handing over uh, to Brussels and therefore will have available for domestic spending. There is already a line in there in uh, the office, office for Budget Responsibilities uh, financial estimates into the, time, 90, into the 2020s for 
UK domestic spending in, in lieu of EU transfers. The money's there. All right, thank you. I'll move on to Gillian Martin now, who may um, pick up some of these yeah, things. And I, I definitely will pick up some of the things that have been said in the, in the whole session. I think it's quite clear that we're saying we want the funding uh, level to continue at the same level or above, and that seems to be clear. But there is a concern that Scotland has punched above its weight in getting access to the European structural funding, and there is a nervousness that that might, sh might decrease. Um, in taking that, what do you think should determine Scotland's regional and local allocations going forward in this shared prosperity fund? What do you think could be in place uh, procedurally to ensure that, for example, um, you talked, we talked about Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. I'm from Aberdeenshire. And you mentioned that GDP is high um, in, in Aberdeenshire. But actually, that is money that a person earns. And you, that doesn't necessarily go into the infrastructure of the area. You just have to look at Union Street to know that that's not the case. And there are pockets of poverty in Aberdeen City and rural poverty. So that can't be a measure, because then we wouldn't get anything. So. What do you see going forward that would protect Scotland's um, I suppose, success in this way, but would also take into account some of the things that you've mentioned around sort of the granularity? Sorry, can I, can I come in here? Because I've actually been doing some hard numbers-based work on um, potential allocation uh, formulae. And uh, in fairness, um, I've been doing this with, um, with Malcolm Leach, who you had in front of you last week, I believe, Mac Malcolm Leach from uh, Glasgow City Council. So we've been, we've been experimenting with certain numbers and looking at how that would work out, both in terms of allocation between the different uh, nations of the UK and also how it might work out if those formulas were applied um, you know, to local areas. Um, and I've got to say, the conclusion that we've reached on the division of the funds between the four nations of the UK is that you cannot, cannot replicate a division uh, that is at all similar to the present division of funds uh, unless you get into some very, very convoluted statistical uh, manipulation. Um, I won't go into details as to why that is, but it's basically uh, to do with um, you know, the changing relative prosperity of certain English sub-regions you know, that have slipped uh, down the rankings and would therefore, um, uh, other things being equal, um, get uh, more funding. Um, now, th that said, um, I wouldn't give up on the idea that Scotland uh, should get or could get uh, anything like the uh, the present share of, of a UK pot of money. Because what I also detect in, in conversations uh, that I've had with a number of, of civil servants, I'm sorry I keep coming back to these conversations, is that there is a great sensitivity, certainly at civil service level, and I suspect also at ministerial level, to this basic division of, of funds between the, uh, the four countries. And there is a recognition that to engage in reallocation uh, in terms of shares between the four countries of, of the UK uh, would potentially invite a political backlash, not least uh, from here in Scotland. And I recall what happened last time round in you know, uh, plotting uh, the allocations for 2014 to 20. I remember, as John has said, um, there was a thought that um, if you followed through the logic that was being deployed in Brussels, Scotland would get rather less money than it actually has got. And I remember full well sitting across the table uh, to, with Nicola Sturgeon, who had this brief at, at that time, and uh, she said, we're not having this. And, and she expressed that point of view uh, down to, uh, to Westminster ministers, and, and they caved in. Um, the real changes in the underlying economic geography of, of, of the UK have not been truly fundamental over the last few years. So there is uh, a case for saying, why don't we simply roll forward the present division of funds between the four countries into whatever follows with the uh, Shared Prosperity Fund? 
Now, beyond that allocation to, um, to the four countries, there's then a, a further issue of how do you construct formulas that allocate sensibly uh, within the countries. We've, um, we've come up with something that, that works um, on that front. Certainly, it works um, in, in England. Um, but the primary issue in Scotland, um, I think, is to, uh, uh, to lay down a marker. Um, the share uh, shouldn't be reduced because the economic fundamentals, you know, it, Scotland against England, against Wales, against Northern Ireland, really haven't changed that much over, uh, over recent years. That's why Scotland has been successful at getting European structural funding because of some of the things that Linda Stewart has mentioned around the issues around uh, population disparity, um, islands, terrain, geography. That, that's brought a ring fence pot of money into, uh, into Highlands and Islands, which is a relatively small component of, the, of, of, of Scotland as a whole. But you know, Scotland as a whole would have received less in this present spending round had the Scottish Government not dug its heels in and said, we're not wearing this. And I've got to say, the approach of the Scottish Government was enormously helpful uh, to us in Northern England as well, who uh, did not want to see a diversion of, uh, of funds to, uh, to more prosperous areas in the South, because we were able to build on the Scottish precedent and say, if that's good enough for them, then it should be good enough for, for, for the North East, North West, Yorkshire, etc. Uh, as well. It was a huge step forward. Yes. Professor Bartle. Yeah, um, the European Commission will, um, in in fact, uh, two weeks yesterday, be publishing its proposals for the uh, formula for allocating structural funds in the next period from 2021 onwards. Um, and it's going to take them, uh, optimistically, at least 18 months and possibly two years to um, agree a set of indicators for allocating funding for determining the spatial eligibility of regions and determining what funding goes to those regions. We've got an increasingly complex formula involving GDP, unemployment, employment, population density, and other indicators, and potentially now is going to include migration, innovation rates, and so on. Now, um, we would potentially have the same issue at UK level if the UK government were to say, we'd like to develop an indicator or new indicator system um, for the allocation of, of, of funding, um, uh, either at local level or between the nations of the UK. So, um, potentially the most partly politically astute, but perhaps most productive way approach would be to say, we're going to take the current structural fund allocation as our starting point, either continue that or have equivalent cuts of 5 10% or whatever it is uh, across the board, um, and then within each part, within each nation, there would be certain principles about how that funding should be allocated, but that funding would be determined by the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament in Scotland. Um, maybe you know, the principles would be um, that it has to target uh, territorial inequality, that it, you know, and, and a series of other, uh, it has to in, uh, in, 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 uh, potentially take particular account of, of poverty, of, um, uh, of, of, of skills deficit, of innovation deficits, and, 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 and so on. Um, so I, 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 to me, I think the issues that we should be thinking about in Scotland are twofold. The, uh, the first is, while funding is important, and the allocation of funding is important, there's the higher level question about why do we want a regional policy? How important is territorial equity? We haven't had that discussion um, really since devolution. And we don't have a, a regional policy as such, um, a coherent regional policy as such. Um, you know, if we look at the contrast between regional policy in Scotland, uh, between, or in the UK, wider UK and other European countries, what we see is that our discussion tends to be primarily about economics, about economic efficiency, about productivity, about innovation and, and competitiveness. Whereas the foundation stone for regional policy in many other European countries is about social justice. It's about the right for people to have equal opportunities to um, equivalent living standards, for example. Um, and in, some, in, in many cases, that's constitutionally laid down as an, as, 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 as an objective. How important is territorial equity in Scotland? And, and in other words, is, is a question I think you know, we, should be, we should be addressing. Um, and you know what's the relationship between the economic uh, and the social? Um, 
and and how and, and to what extent and, and, and how do we want to translate that you know into, into practice there's a danger of thinking about funds and schemes which is the classic uk government approach thinking of schemes and, and, and funds in the instruments rather than what it is that more broadly we want to achieve again if we want to learn from our from our for uh, uh, other european counterparts say in the nordic countries you know regional policy is not a scheme like regional selective assistance it's a framework that a range of policies education environment transport industry contribute to um, and then there are the the institutional arrangements um, about um, you know how do we want to coordinate these this this very diverse mix of spatial initiatives that are evolving city regions for instance and regional partnerships framework for it actually <clears throat> comes to Scotland and then it's obviously devolved to regions <clears throat> that comes on to our next thing that I was wanting to talk about is you've been critical but lacks of flip like still sorry lack of flexibility <clears throat> and talking about my region again of course we just had a big economic shock the oil price plummeted uh, lots of people lost their jobs um, people who've been you know um, doing very well for 40 years all of a sudden had no orders coming through their their, their doors do you think that there should be a responsiveness aspect that's maybe missing with the current structure to economic shocks that that could be built in to to a framework if it was um, resided here in scotland very briefly i i, I th sorry linda no, on you go. Uh, john has outlined um quite thoroughly the sorts of qualities uh, a, a replacement fund should have the the importance of the multi-annual uh, aspect of it you multi-annual finance for multi-annual problems rather than just the annual funding round the partnership principle and so on and so on and it's interesting to see that the local government association in england the COSLA in scotland have been asking for the fact that well look we have a we have an opportunity here as well to make things more flexible mm -hmm. we don't have to follow exactly the audit rules that currently exist for structural funds we don't have to follow all the um, the rules on n plus three necessarily although it might be a good idea uh, of course therefore you could have even a sub fund which is dedicated to crisis situations that fund exists in the eu anyway uh, there is a lot of discussion about how best it is um, dovetailing with the easy the ESIF fund and um, there are a whole host of issues that you could design yourself taking advantage of the framework that exists already all the benefits of that but making it more flexible and uh, more uh, more targeted addressing our specific needs and linda stewart yeah, yes i would agree with that and i would ve very much echo a lot of what what john has said about the, the way forward there um maybe just i'm very much aware of time here to pick up on a couple of the, the specific points that the, the member raised there i think you've hit the nail on the head when we talk about what is it we're measuring and how are we going to do that um, how we measure success what the indicators are for a future replacement of ESIF. That is absolutely fundamental. And once you've got that in place, you can, you can look at the formulae for how you're allocating funding, how you're going to prioritise within that, and, and, and so on. And I think um, it's been largely acknowledged, certainly in Scotland and previous similar discussions, that GDP itself is far too blunt an instrument to do that. We need to be bringing in other indicators as well. And we do need to get to the heart of this whole regional policy questions that John, John mentioned there. What is it we're trying to do with regional policy? Are we looking at equity of opportunities or are we trying to do something else? And you just need, I think, to look at some of the city deals that are doing some excellent work in their own right. But that is quite distinct to how we've approached regional policy through ESIF in the past in, in Scotland. Um, and again, I mentioned some of, some of the issues around the Highlands and Islands and the, the dangers of losing territorial cohesion policy approaches, recognising regional disparities as such. Um, so I think a place-based approach is going to have to be part of the, the mix that we do here so that we are identifying not just the challenges that we've got at regional level, but the opportunities as, as well. Part 
partnership has to be fundamental to this. And to pick up on your, your Aberdeen um, experience there, if we look back to 2014, um, the place of ESIF and what it was doing to support the Aberdeen and the North East economy was completely different to where we're at now with the changes in the oil and gas sector there. And there does need to be a system, and again, this is one of the opportunities perhaps that we have looking forward, having an approach that can be more flexible, that can be more responsive to changing circumstances. Within that, though, there were so many benefits of what we've had in the past on a longer term strategic six to seven year programme. So that partners are able to plan ahead to look at what might happen in, in that time frame must be place-based but let's not lose sight of the urgency to have some of these much more detailed discussions and just to finish time doesn't allow but of course when we're looking at ESIF we should be incorporating what's happening with the fisheries and agriculture um, funds as well which is going to how that is changing in the future is going to have a massive impact right across the whole of Scotland so this conversation needs to be quite broad but we really need to get a move on with addressing some of these very serious issues or it will have missed another opportunity thank you very much right, uh, a follow-up from Jamie Halker Johnson and then John Mason thanks very much it was just a, quite a quick one I'm very I'm glad you brought the fisheries and agriculture having come down from Orkney today and representing the highlands and islands um, I was just going to ask we, there was mentioned about the Nordic um, examples but I was wondering whether there are examples out with the EU um, that we could be looking in terms of um, you know regional policy something that we should be uh, incorporating in terms of looking for the shared prosperity fund yeah uh, sorry <laughs> I, I mean the um a, 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 apart, from, apart from Norway, which um, I've already mentioned in, in, in the Nordic context, I think there's some interesting developments going in, in Switzerland, where there are some uh, uh, some um, similarities in terms of um, areas with sparsity of population, remoteness, particularly in in, um, in sort of alpine valleys. Uh, but they've been forging a new regional policy, which draws on um, over the last eight years, I suppose, which draws on some EU experiences, but is very much adapted to Swiss federalist um, fe federalist circumstances. And um, our, our, um, our, if you like, following the some aspects of the debates that's been going on in, 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 in other countries, which is about um, thinking more flexibly about, about space, that you know, the economic and social development problems that we have don't follow territorial boundaries. Um, and so um, to think about in the jargon sort of place-based policy approach, which is um, that you, know, you think about well, where are the territories that are affected by particular challenges um, and then you design and, and, and those may cut across um, sub-regions, local, local, local authorities or whatever and design, if you like, a bottom-up approach to, um, to, to, to the policy responses, drawing very much on, on communities and local knowledge. Um, while having, if you like, top-down objectives, so it, it and um, so that's a, a different way of thinking about uh, about geography, but also about the kind of institutions that you you need to respond to that. Again, less top-down, less prescriptive, more more bottom, bottom more flexible, and I think that's where um, without the constraints of um, European structural investment funds and all of the, the conditions and administrative obligations. I think you know we could think of, we could think um, quite quite radically about um, how we might uh, uh, how we might like to change, and I think so. Switzerland is 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 one of the countries that that has very much tried to do that, and uh, uh, and we can provide more information if, if you're interested. But I mean, it's taken them to de develop that, whether it's an ongoing process or it is because uh, it is very much an ongoing process because the cantons very jealously have. Um, protect their, uh, their 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 constitutional responsibilities, um, but it's uh, and it certainly hasn't been easy. It, but uh, and it has taken them about uh, probably about eight years, um, and it's still evolving. Right, briefly, Linda Stewart, and then yeah. John Mason. 
Very briefly, another um, interesting example is work that we've been doing with other Highlands and Islands partners recently with Canadian institutions, similar issues around um, sparsity population, island regions and, and, and so on. What's interesting is it's the same conversations, it's the same challenges, but I think there's so much benefit in actually having these conversations. And just very briefly, to, to bring us back to EU partners, there's been so much interesting work done on that issue of territorial cooperation through the Interreg programmes, particularly in some of the work going on just now with Irish partners north and south of the border. And again, I think that needs to be part of our future planning, what's going to be happening with the Interreg programmes. Um, there's been some huge benefit there. I mean, there's obviously with the, the, the cross-border programmes with uh, Northern Ireland and, and the Republic, wider political issues around that in the peace uh, programme, but on the ground through the, the, the um, interreg cross-border programme that West of Scotland shares uh, with these regions, there's been some terrific good cross-border cooperation going on there, so let's make sure we don't lose that as well. Okay, uh, thanks convener. Um, it's building on especially some of the things that Julian Martin uh, was looking at. I mean, I'm looking, uh, Professor Barkler, at your table in your paper on page seven. It's called Table Three, which shows how the money is split up between around the UK. And uh, I mean, I'm interested that, in fact, the UK average is £172 per head, whereas Scotland is £169. So we're actually below the UK average at the moment. Wales appears to be the big winner with £788 per head. So that's quite dramatic. And uh, tying that in with the Industrial Communities Alliance, I think, has suggested that uh, the south of England might be arguing for more money as a, as a part of the region. I mean, is, the, is that argument based on their need has increased relatively and therefore they want more money? Or is it just because they only get £33 per head and that doesn't seem very much? Um, and also wonder if Professor Bachler could say anything about uh, where the EU is going. I mean, how if we adopted the EU proposals for the next four or five years, how would that affect this table and, and how the mix is shared out? Um, yes, I mean, the, the table uh, that you're referring to is, is actually on, in, in euro rather than pounds, but oh, sorry, your, right, your, okay, basic sorry, point, yeah. uh, your basic point applies. Um, and it is very much driven by the uh, EU's methodology, um, which maximises the aid intensity in um, what are called less developed regions. So Wales has benefited from West Wales being a less developed region and South West England from Cornwall being a less developed region. Um, it also, um, and, and so there are indicators in terms of the regional gap in terms of GDP uh, between those regions and the EU average. Um, there are premia related to the number of unemployed people uh, that, 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 that come into play. There is a, um, I mean, I can provide a, um, a, a breakdown of the, of the formula, but there are also what are called caps and safety nets and ceilings that have, have, have had an influence on, on the allocation. Um, that's to, to the UK, but based on regional situation. Um, the Would you agree with Professor Fothergill's point that you, you, we're not going to replicate this. Whatever happens, that kind of split is not going to be replicated. Uh, not, not at this level, no. no. Um, I mean, if, I think if you also look at um, Table Seven in the same paper on page eleven, you can see the way that um, uh, <coughs> changes in GDP per head would potentially impact on the eligibility of different regions. So, for example, Highlands, you know, high, under the current system, Highlands and Islands um, would no longer be a transition region. It would be a more developed region, but Southwest Scotland would become a transition region. Now, this is very much a, you know, a sort of academic exercise, but um, the, we wouldn't have the same map now um, that using the same indicators that we would have had, that we have from 2014. Now, in terms of the, 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 the future, um, we now have the, Commission's, the European Commission's proposals about the amount of funding that's going to be allocated to um, cohesion policy, um, um, particularly structural funds, for the next period. Um, that's, on average, a cut of a, between 6 and 7%, depending how you calculate it. Um, and the likelihood that there is going to be a requirement for member states to co-finance 
more of their share of the funding, probably particularly um, in the richer countries. Uh, the, uh, so that's, that's the global budget, if you like, that goes to, the, goes to the policy. What we don't know is the allocation formula, and we've been told that while GDP will remain significant, there will be new indicators relating to potentially innovation or migration um, that uh, have been particularly designed to, in terms of migration, benefit those countries receiving a lot of migrants, like Germany, um, and penalize countries like Central East Europe, which haven't, um, but also focus more on some of the broader EU policy objectives, innovation, climate change. So um, that, again, would benefit the South and the East broadly um, in, 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 in general terms. So I think um, particularly because the Southern Europe did badly relative to its problems um, of unemployment um, in the settlement in 2013, it's likely that there's going to be a certain shift in funding to the southern member states. Um, the question is what happens to the more developed countries. Uh, the thinking at the moment is that um, they, will still, they will still be part of the policy, but they may be facing cuts of up to a third, um, quarter a third. Except that it's not a definite. No. But there's a bit forward. of a bazaar at the moment in, in, in Brussels trading information, yes. um, which we won't know actually until okay, the question. That's, that's great. Maybe Professor Fothergal. Yeah. Look, look, we're, we're leaving the European Union. Um, I can't see the Westminster government in planning the new shared prosperity fund trying to replicate what would have happened if we'd have stayed in the European Union. Um, you know, the, the issues of, you know, what the fund is, is, is spent on, um, uh, how it is allocated ac across the UK, you know, they're not going to be driven by, you know, decisions taken in Brussels. I mean, of course, people in the, uh, in the UK regions may look over to, um, to Brussels and say, well, that's happening there, why isn't it happening here? But um, I, I'm not sure that argument will necessarily cut, um, cut too much ice. Now, now, let me just clarify the point you were saying that I was arguing that it's not going to happen, that, that present division of funds. It's not going to happen again. What I was actually saying is if you try to recreate that division of funds using statistics, it's very, very difficult, if not nigh and impossible, to get there. That is very diff different uh, for saying, to saying that um, that division of the funds uh, cannot happen again because that is fundamentally a political decision. Um, and well, presumably, would you, would you accept that the UK government is going to come up with some system that actually measures things, and on that basis, it won't happen again? I, it's, it'll only be if they don't come up with a system like no, that? No, I, I, I think there'll be two levels to this. I mean, one, there will be a high-level political decision about the carve-up between the, um, uh, the four countries of the UK, which is not, uh, at the end of the day, driven by numbers. Then, uh, certainly within England, I can't speak for Scotland, uh, within England, um, they're likely to come up with some system for, uh, for targeting those funds um, at the areas uh, that they want to support, support, which historically certainly have been the weaker uh, local economies. The Scottish Government will then presumably have you know, quite a lot of leeway within broad UK guidelines to design you know, its own internal allocation formula. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Gordon MacDonald. Um, we've talked this morning about um, the amount of bureaucracy involved in uh, EU funding and last week there was a call for a need to simplify the management of funds etc. Now given that there's very little detail regarding the UK uh, Shared Prosperity Fund, we've obviously got the opportunity to hopefully influence UK government thinking. So how do we get the right balance between maximum impact on the ground of this funding and ensuring accountability. Linda Stewart. I, th I think that's our, our big challenge, <coughs> excuse me, just now, is to, to work on getting that balance absolutely right. Uh, we mentioned before about um, the opportunities to simplify and want it be good in a new programme of whatever nature to, to look at simplification. Um, we were promised that we would simplify the system in the current programmes and to an extent um, new simplified options like unit cost models were brought in 
But by and large, very little was actually discarded. So the same level of having to evidence um, activities and uh, complexities and uncertainties around um, what is, is eligible and, and compliance, it, it's actually ended up being even more complicated. So I think there needs to be a degree of um, be, being ambitious and perhaps um, looking at the opportunity to say, OK, this is public money. Of course, it has to be accountable and, and transparent. But <clears throat> we have lots of very good systems in place across Scotland in any case. Again, look at my own sector in, in education and, and innovation. When we fund students at whatever level, further or higher education, we have very good methods for making sure that the, that the student is eligible for that funding and the money actually goes, goes to that student as is required. Why are we trying to add extra layers of bureaucracy on top of that when we don't need to? By all means, if there's some, ex you know, when, when we've decided what the, the indicators are, if there's some extra information that needs to be captured, do that within existing systems instead of trying to build something else on. Um, and I think that that's the big opportunity to, to, to look at that. But um, it absolutely needs to be in light of what we're actually wanting to do with the funds. That's what really, really matters what we do with the funds, and then find an acceptable and um, accountable method of delivering and, and spending the, the, the funds within that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Robin Smale. Uh, briefly, I think, as Linda says, simplification has tended to mean more work for the member states. It's been simplification for the European Commission, which is perhaps normal as they have they're finding themselves streamlined. So there are obviously a number of features of the current system that we may wish to let go of. As I mentioned earlier, there's the uh, audit requirements and probably we will just follow UK audit standards and procedures rather than follow the EU's setup. Uh, with respect to financial control, most EU countries have found the process of management verifications to be a huge burden, that is to say checking all the expenditure of projects uh, which are submitted to authorities. This is something which uh, may be simplified if we understand that the audit results in the UK and Scotland are satisfactory. The automatic decommitment rule may be common sense. You may wish to continue with that. A lot of member states are, according to the EU, guilty of gold plating. That is to say, adding all their own eligibility rules, eligibility of expenditure rules, on top of the EU's eligibility of expenditure rules. But clearly, the UK, the UK and Scotland will have its own eligibility of expenditure rules anyway. Requirements for things like public procurement procedures. These are one of the greatest sources of error in EU program expenditure. And uh, we will no doubt be uh, continuing with the legislation which exists in that field as we will in state aid, I imagine. And we will devise our own rules perhaps on things like revenue generating projects, which again have been a source of error and challenges across the EU. How you achieve impact, the other side of the coin, is about identifying your priorities in the strategy, identifying those areas where you can, where you have an opportunity as well to um, generate new wealth. And I did refer to certain areas where I felt we perhaps need to focus on more than we have done in the past, such as greater efforts to expand the company base, greater efforts to encourage startups and support startups, which, according to a recent post office survey, Scotland leads the UK in terms of startup survival rates after five years. We have very fine delivery mechanisms in this field. Um, and the other way, perhaps, to be achieving, checking that one is achieving 
impact would be to devise our own system uh, of monitoring similar to that used perhaps in current programs but not the same. We're good at devising indicators. We are good at monitoring those indicators, checking that we're achieving certain results. And we are good at evaluating the impact of our policies. And we should be continuing to do that. Um, the UK and Scotland are good at um, uh, administrating the, the ske various schemes and projects. Some of, place. Some of them. Some of them. Some of them. Is there any countries abroad that, if we were to try and cut the bureaucracy, that we could learn from? Yes, um, I think what's important is that a lot of the problems with EU funding are that in, in every country there is a domestic system for economic development and then we've got the EU one. And so we have parallel circuits, if you like, of administrative practices and rules that somehow have to work together. Now, with the removal of the EU regulatory requirements, you know, the default is what we're doing anyway. It, so. You know, in areas like financial management and control, in areas like audit, in terms of monitoring, evaluation, communication, performance management, we have systems. Um, uh, there are th aspects, as Robin said, in terms of state aids and public procurement that we would have to continue most likely to follow um, the, uh, the, the, the EU regulatory framework. But I think that the, 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 the question is not having to reinvent anything. It's a question of saying, well, okay, which bits within our domestic system, which is functioning, um, I wouldn't say perfectly well, but is functioning reasonably well, do we want to enhance by taking selective elements of the EU system? And just my, fi my final question would be, um, given the time constraints we've got, uh, what one thing would you change in terms of economic regional policy uh, in order to make it more effective in terms of either focus on a sector or geographically or what, what would you change? Uh, I um, I think I'd, I'd shift the emphasis a little bit more towards direct support to businesses. Um, I mean, if you look back at the, um, the long history of UK regional policy, certainly in the days when I first um, engaged with it, uh, regional policy essentially meant giving financial support to companies to encourage them to invest, to create jobs, to, to expand. Uh, and the UK government, um, once upon a time, put very serious money um, in, into that area of work. Scotland still uh, does put some money in, I've got to say, through regional selective assistance, but it's done nothing like the, uh, uh, the scale that um, uh, we used to. Uh, now, we are constrained, in fairness, by EU state aid rules at present, and there is a huge question mark about the extent to which we will remain constrained by EU state aid rules even once we've left the European Union. That's an issue for negotiation uh, with Brussels. But it's always seemed to me that the most direct way to try to um, create jobs, to increase output, to, to raise productivity um, in, uh, in the less prosperous areas in particular is to have some you know, direct financial support to, to, to companies. And, um, you know, if there was one thing that I'd like to see in terms of a shift, it would therefore be from um, the rather contextual investments that largely go on at present and, and are co-funded by the European Union to improve the wider environment for, for business and for, for employees through to perhaps more direct, you know, targeting um, of, of um, job creating uh, and output increasing investment. Robin Smell. I've already mentioned a couple. You asked for one more. That's difficult. Foreign direct investment. I mean, if you ask me what are the three quickest ways of growing your economy, the three quickest ways, it would be new money. Foreign direct investment, export-led sectors, yeah. Yeah. and uh, the third way would be tourism. I know it's not very popular amongst uh, the European uh, Union officials just now, but tourism is the third. Um, 
But I, I, I would like to just add a, a slight angle to what uh, Steve was saying. There's been a shift in the EU away from the thinking about handing over grants towards loans to businesses. Now, when Juncker became the European Commission president, he came up with his Juncker plan. And the Juncker plan was designed to address the investment deficit across much of Europe after the financial crisis. And there's a special fund, the European Fund for Strategic Investment, which is proving to be quite successful, where the public sector is providing a guarantee to relatively risky major investment projects. And this is encouraging the provision of uh, subordinated debt to projects from other public sector bodies, which in turn leaves, leads to senior tranches of investment from the private sector. Um, indeed, it's so successful it scares DG Regio, because they think this is a return to projects being approved directly by Brussels rather than member state programs. So I think as the money becomes, the pot becomes smaller, there will be a shift away from grants to businesses towards loans and repayable assistance. The, the, the one thing that I think I would um, look for is more of a place-based strategy across the whole of Scotland, so taking into account the regional disparities and the arguments and issues we've had to deal with in the Highlands and Islands, but looking at how that translates across the whole of Scotland, but with a much more positive slant to it, instead of just saying, oh, poor us because we've got a difficult economy or, or whatever, it's saying, how can we make the most of what potential there is there? long lines of the smart specialisation strategies that, that, that we've seen, so adapted to regional circumstances, and making sure that you can contribute, yes, to your regional growth, but to national growth as, as well, which means you're building up the capacity so that you are able then to participate and contribute to some of the, the very good examples that my colleagues have just mentioned here. Thanks. Professor yeah. right, thank you. Uh, A final follow-up from Dean Lockhart and Professor Bachler can come back in on the, the points raised there. Um, Dean, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, convener, and good morning. I've got a question that cuts across a number of the points uh, discussed today about targeted funding and strategic direction and increasing partnership uh, working, and it's the role of the enterprise agencies and how uh, there has been a review of the enterprise agencies with the setting up of the strategic board, and very br briefly, if I may, uh, how, how do you see the role of the enterprise agencies going forward, and what can they do to increase the, 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 the issues I've highlighted? Start perhaps with Professor Bachler to cover the two points that and the previous. Yeah, um, I, uh, I, th I think this is, uh, I'm probably not the best person to, to ask about the enterprise agencies, but um, in terms of the review that have been done, I think what interests me in particular is the regionalization or the return, if you like, to um, a more sub-regional local approach. Um, and I think we have become too centralized in our domestic policies over time. And it links with what I said, um, what, what, what I said before. Um, uh, if, we're, if we're to give meaning to what Linda Stewart was talking about, it's a more place-based policy approach. Um, firstly, policy across the board needs to be more responsive to local needs and development challenges. But crucially also, um, we need to tap into the potential of community developments, and that links with what I was going to say is my one, um, my, my one recommendation. We've got, um, if we compare Scotland with other EU country, uh, with other European countries, not not, not EU member states, um, what is missing is um, a, a real local or sort of community dimension to, to to economic development. What we call Community planning partnerships, for example, are no such thing. They're not community. Uh, you know, they are, uh, uh, if you like, sub-regional. Um, what would you call sub-regional in many other countries? And I think we are failing to exploit the potential of of, of community development. Um, and uh, th there are some interesting directions in terms of where the Community Empowerment Act is, is, is potentially taking us and the agreement with COSLA to devolve certain 
uh, a percentage of one percent, I think it is, um, to communities. I think I, I would be in favour of accelerating that process very, very considerably, um, and with the enterprise agencies very much in, in, in engaged in that process. Linda Stewart. Just again, I would agree very strongly with what John said there, and I think a further element where, where there's a really good opportunity with, with what's happening with the new strategic board is to align what's happening with um, skills and innovation more closely with the inclusion of the, the Scottish Funding Council in, in the, this approach there. And I think that does give us a very, very good starting point for a lot of the, the, the regional strategies that we might want to be starting to, to think of. A very, very good context setting there. And absolutely bring in the community element that John talked about before. That's something that has been a key feature of Highland Science Enterprise since the establishment of Highland Science Development Board in it, uh, 1964. Um, and it's something that's proved really, really important. We, we tried very hard in the Highlands and Islands to bring that element in more closely to the 2007 to 13 programmes through the distinct involvement of community planning partnerships. That was working to an extent, but again, when we looked at the possibilities of a, an integrated territorial investment that John mentioned earlier, that was deemed not to be appropriate. I think there was a lot of very good potential benefits in that kind of approach, that again, we, it's, it's worth investigating further as we move forward. Thank you. Well, thank you very much then to um, all of our witnesses for coming in today. Um, uh, and uh, I'll now suspend the meeting and we'll move into private session. Thank you very much.